When you think of the Bastille, you probably don't think of fine dining. And yet the prison often held people of rank who would be back in society fairly soon, and they had to be fed accordingly, which meant it had a good kitchen, and often people of lesser rank benefited from this, as we will see. But before we look at the food, I'm going to uh, assume that a certain number of you don't know much about the Bastille at all, besides the fact that it was a symbol of despotism and it was destroyed. It was not built as a prison. It was built as a gatehouse on the eastern side of the walls of Charles V. Now, if you go to Paris today and walk what are called the Grand Boulevard, which really are just one long curve that changes names as you go along, that's where the walls of Charles V used to be. And all the way over at the eastern side, you had this reinforced gate. And if you look at a later picture of the Bastille, you can see where they filled in the gate, because later on they built another gate called the Pelt Saint Antoine to the north of the Bastille. The first prisoner in the Bastille was the man who built it, a man named Hugh Aubriot, who had been the provost of Paris and directed the building of the castle. And then Seems to have gotten into it with the town authorities, ended up locked up in the Bastille. We don't know if he had the run of the place or if he was just locked up in one of the towers, but still, this would have been better than most prisons of the time. Over time, it seems to have been used more often as a prison by the uh, 15th century. It seems to have mainly been a prison, and you began to see a gate towards the northern side. By the 17th century, we get some accounts in memoirs of being in the Bastille. They don't say much about the food. There was one man who had a friend in the Bastille and went to see him and said that the prisoners really had the run of the place. You could have people over. You could take them up to view the sights from the top of the towers. He claims they were as free as a warden, that is the governor, as they called them. It's pretty unlikely. In this same period, one of the prisoners had been the governor of the Bastille. Bassompierre was the governor of the Bastille and then found himself locked up there. So fortunes shifted. But it's not until the start of the 18th century that we begin to get close-up glimpses of the food in the Bastille and full-on memoirs. First, from a man named Ranville. Ranville was a, a Protestant, which could get you locked up all by itself at the start of the 18th century. He was accused of being a spy and ended up in the Bastille for about 11 years. He ultimately wrote a memoir, which was translated and very popular in English as the French Inquisition. And... Uh, he early on met a man, also a Protestant, who was accused of treason and had been locked up in the worst circumstances and said that for a long time he only got a little soup of boiled water and about two ounces of meat worse than what they give soldiers. Now you will see this phrase quite a bit in the 18th century. It really makes you feel sorry for soldiers because apparently the standard for the worst meat was uh, food for soldiers, the worst food, and you'll see this phrase quite a bit. There was also an official at the time named Dejunka who was in charge of the food for the prisoners, which he said was often bad with bad wine and dirty linen. And yet Ranville said uh, that early on they brought him a one pound loaf of bread cooked the day before the finest in Paris, and one pound is probably a roll a bottle of wine, about three half setiers for dinner, and another for his supper. And then he said on fast days, things were even better. Now note, the wine and bread in the morning were breakfast, and this was a very common breakfast in France until about this time when the French began to drink hot chocolate and coffee, and that sort of thing for breakfast, but it was still a fairly common breakfast. Uh, Early on, he says his dinner, his midday meal, consisted of a soup of green peas, which were considered a luxury in the time, garnished with lettuce, which was still often cooked as a side, 
well simmered and appetizing with a quarter of fowl on it. In one dish, there was a succulent slice of beef with juice and a crown of parsley and another a quarter of godivo. Now, godivo was a kind of meat pie with veal sweetmeats, cock's crests, which were a common garnishing, asparagus, mushrooms, truffles. So a very rich piece of meat pie. And then another a sheep's tongue in sauce, all very well prepared, he said. And for dessert, a biscuit and two rennet apples, which is to say very good apples. For supper, his evening meal, he got a nice piece of roast with its juices, along with another dish of half a chicken, and then the other beati, which could be a stew or a sauce. You see beati mentioned through the 17th and 18th century. It was a mixture of cock's crest, mushrooms, sweetbreads, a uh, very rich kind of sauce. And with this came a salad of hearts of lettuce, very well seasoned, and for dessert, a dish of strawberries in wine and sugar. Again, sounds pretty good. And he said from May to July, this was how he was treated with substitutes. So if he had a quarter of fowl in his soup one day, he would have a veal shank or a thick slice of mutton. Another, always some pastry, that is savory paste goods, little pasties or quarter go de veau. And then in the evening, one day it was lamb or mutton with squab, that's baby pigeon. Another it was veal and half a chicken or a quarter of a capon and always a different sauce with a salad and a dessert all nicely served and very good. This was 18th century France so people took fast days seriously and on fast days usually Fridays but uh, sometimes other days as well. I had a good soup sometimes of shrimp, of oysters, of mussels, with a plate of very good fish, boiled, one roasted or fried, and a dish of vegetables, such as asparagus, artichokes, peas, cauliflower, if in season, as well as dessert. And he goes into some detail about the fish, which could be fresh or salt water. I can say it was the best of the fish market, often fresh salmon, weaver, sole, perch, pike, trout, uh, in the best inns of Paris, he said, I could not have eaten better for a crown per meal. But later, when things declined, and he doesn't say why, though it was probably a new governor, I got beef worse than what they give soldiers, and awful vegetables, peas, broad beans, string beans, lentils. Uh, he probably means they were poor quality, not that these in themselves were bad vegetables, cooked in salt and water. And yet the king paid the same price, a pistol, that is a Spanish crown, per day for his food. There was a garden named Roux, a gruff but kindly man who brought him the same bread and wine every day. And then for dinner, they'd cut back a great deal, he says, but still he had a good soup with croutons, a decent piece of beef, a mutton tongue in sauce, and two echaudets for dessert. Echaudet means scalded, and the echaudet had been a common treat in France since the Middle Ages. You can still find them today. Uh, they were baked and then scalded, that is, put in hot water. Sometimes he said he got a wing or leg of fowl in addition, sometimes two small pasties, but often he noticed that Lou had nibbled the pastries because there were little bits left on the edge of the plate, which suggests that the guards were not as well fed as the prisoners. In the evening, I had roast veal or mutton with a little sauce, sometimes a squab and sometimes more rarely half a chicken and from time to time a salad. At one point, one of his cellmates gave the jailer an expensive ring, and then he said they ate very well. Pigeons, capons, game, sweets, pastry, dessert, champagne, and burgundy wine. Uh, we lacked nothing. The champagne would have been a still red wine at this point, but still one of the better wines. Note that champagne and burgundy are both regions near Paris, so you see those wines mentioned quite a bit. But then, ironically enough, the man's rich father guaranteed payment, whereupon one of the guards, in Ranville's words, plucked the poor pigeon exorbitantly. He tried to pass off wine that cost at most six bottles, uh, six souls a bottle, for 
champagne at 20 souls, nasty apples which would have revolted pigs for rennet apples, small rotten chestnuts for those of man, tough old chicken for the wild chickens of Cotentin. And finally the cellmate wisened up, said, look, just charge me the double for everything, and that man took his cut, and they got better food. Now, at some point, Lanville got into it with the authorities, not a smart thing to do. And he found himself in the cachot. The cachot matched the worst fantasy of what the Bastille was like. These were underground cells, very humid. Sometimes the prisoners in them really were uh, given bread and water. And one day, Roux found him there, was horrified, and sent him a roast weaver, a fried sole, a dish of asparagus and oil, and two bottles of champagne. I can declare that in my life I have never had a meal that seems so delicious, he says. Now, he does pass on an account from another prisoner who had been there for a while, and this man had been there under Governor de Bessamo, and said then prisoners were brought every morning a large basket covered with white linen, three loaves cooked overnight, weighing together a pound, so these were rolls again, fruit of the season, enough for the day, this really sounds like a gift basket, and two bottles of champagne or burgundy wine. At noon, they got a well-seasoned soup with a pound of boiled meat, the most succulent in Paris, beef, veal, and mutton, and a dish of sauce. And then in the evening, they were given half a pound of roast meat, beef, veal, mutton, or lamb, half a chicken, or a rabbit, or a squab, or an equivalent stew, and always a small salad. Now, most prisoners couldn't finish all this, which meant if they only ate one meal, they got 15 souls for the other. If they only took one of the two bottles of wine, they were given seven and a half sous, or uh, maybe 10, for the other bottle. So you could eat very well and still make something of a profit. But then, says a prisoner under Belneville, who is the current governor, we only have two or three ounces of carrion a day because one would think it came from the road rather than from the butcher. As to the wine, it is only that in name. Now, he may have been exaggerating because he is, after all, writing about the same period when Belneville was there. If you look at the general layout of the main building, which is part of a larger complex, you see that about three quarters of the way in from the entrance, there was a long building that went from one side to the other. In this building was a library, a chapel, an office, and the kitchen. Very important. Okay, so in 1760, Voltaire wrote that a certain Abbe Morellet had been put in the Bastille. An Abbe in the 18th century was a clergyman, but often to a kind of society intellectual received at the best salon, uh, presumably witty and erudite. The danger of being witty, especially, was that it could land you in the Bastille. We don't know why Morellet ended up in the Bastille. People worked very hard, very quickly to get him out. But he says that when he was there, each day he got a bottle of decent wine, an excellent one-pound loaf of bread for a uh, dinner, a soup, some beef, an entree, and a dessert, and the evening some roast and a salad. So he's not over the top about it, but he seemed very happy with what he got. And then another of the philosophes. So Voltaire and Diderot were considered philosophes, philosophers, thinkers. And another was a man named Malmontel. And Malmontel was put in the Bastille with his servant, which was not unusual, though people apparently had to pay for their servants when they kept them with them. This was a man named Bury. And about two hours after they got there, some guards came up with three dishes in cheap earthenware. And then the other uh, guard took coarse but clean linen and laid it out as a tablecloth. And they assumed this was Montel's dinner, and as they left, uh, Bully began to serve him. It was a Friday, so this was a fast day meal. First, it was a puree of white broad beans made with the freshest butter and a dish of the same beans. He found this very good. Then a dish of cod, which was even better. The little accent of garlic seasoned it with a delicacy of taste and odor which would have flattered the taste of the most gourmet Gascon. 
and they were known for their gourmandise, the Gascon. And the wine was decent, no dessert, but it was the Bastille. So he then got up to let Brully finish what he had left, and just then the guards came back with good earthenware, fine linen, a silver spoon and fork. They didn't tend to give you knives, or if they did, they were dull. And uh, after they left, Bury and Mamontel looked at each other and had a good laugh, because they realized they'd made a mistake. And Bury said, Monsieur, you just ate my dinner. I hope you won't mind if I in turn eat yours. And they had a good laugh. Now, what was the meal for the master? Well, even though it was a fast day, he got an excellent soup, a succulent slice of beef, a boiled leg of capon dripping with fat and falling off the bone, a small plate of fried artichokes and a marinade, one of spinach, a very nice cresson pear, and again, a cresson is a good type of pear, fresh grapes, a bottle of old burgundy, and the best Mocha coffee, not just any coffee, and this is the first mention I know of, of coffee in the Bastille, but mocha coffee. And Bully sat down, ate all this, but left the fruit and the coffee for his master. And he said that after that, he was fed this way uh, for the whole time he was in the Bastille. Now, again, there are other accounts, and uh, one of the later accounts that was published after the castle fell said that they got a pound of bread and a bottle of bad wine a day. Dinner was at 11 in the morning, broth and two meat dishes. For supper, which was six in the evening, they got a slice of rope, a roast, some sauce, and some salad, but all disgusting. And then fast day meals with rancid butter or sickening oil. Uh, we have another prisoner, very interesting man, the General du Maurier, who had fought for Louis XV, apparently ended up in the Bastille, not on his own account, but because they were trying to pressure whoever his immediate uh, superior was at that point. Later, he would fight for the revolutionaries and then go over to the other side, and he left very rich memoirs. And one thing he says here is that he was arrested on a Friday too late to be fed by the kitchen, so he asked the major to send out for a chicken. And you could send out for food very easily in 18th century France. There were a lot of traiteurs who did serve in their own places, but also did take out. And the major said, it's a Friday. To which uh, Dumarier said, you are responsible for my keep and not my conscience. Besides, I am sick because the Bastille is an illness. Don't refuse me a chicken. And apparently he got his chicken. But otherwise, he said elsewhere, one was very well fed at the Bastille. There were always five dishes for dinner, three for supper without the dessert, which served all together looked magnificent. So one of the grumpier memoirists, and the last one, was a man named Simon-Henri Languet. And he complained about other people's food, said it wasn't very good, but then he said, there are tables less lacking. I confess it, mine was among them. So he had to admit that he was actually fed pretty well, which probably irritated him a great deal because uh, he didn't get to complain. He actually did sort of like to complain. Also, in 1750, the castle began to give prisoners a raving, uh, something that will be familiar to somebody who started a new job or maybe started college, and they give you a schedule or point to it and say, this is what the cafeteria serves each day. And they had one of these for the Bastille. It only listed the main courses because we know there were vegetables and desserts and things of that sort. but. On Sunday, you got a small pasty for dinner, and then for supper, you got a tongue and sauce or a veal liver pique. On Monday, you got a collar of mutton for dinner, veal or mutton with sauce for supper, a petit salé, which is beans with pork for dinner, mutton or veal with sauce for supper, a tult, which again was a kind of meat pie for dinner, beef a la mode for supper, mutton or veal collar for dinner, chicken, fowl, game, pigeons, or stew for supper. 
All it says for Friday is lean. Uh, probably they got fish, they just didn't know what would be available in advance. And then on Saturday, sausage for dinner and veal or mutton and sauce. Now there's another note that if the roast was veal, then the other dish would be mutton and vice versa. Uh, and so on Wednesday you get a beef a la mode, but then you would also get a veal roast. So that's not explicit in the schedule, but that's another aspect of this schedule. Also, if you were well off, you could pay your guard and get food from the outside. Uh, and then the Marquis de Sade, who was on the outs with his wife, but still communicating with her when he was in the Bastille, wanted a particular kind of wine she drank, and he got permission to have it, but he had to pay for it. We also have a list of extra expenses for Monsieur Tavernier, and these date from May 1789, so two months before there was no more Bastille. And he got a pound and a quarter of tobacco, and probably all the prisoners smoked, uh, or a lot of them, they would have smoked pipes. Four bottles of brandy, you're in the Bastille, you might as well get drunk. Wine, beer, very drunk. 30 pounds of rye bread, which is strange because rye bread was really a down market bread, but apparently this man just liked rye bread. Three pounds of candles, 28 pigeons with peas. And you'll note that we really haven't seen many pigeons in the previous meal, so it was a finer kind of bird. Peas were still something of a luxury. Two pounds of curds and three pounds of sugar. I would imagine the sugar was put in the curds and cheese, which we haven't seen mentioned elsewhere. Also, some prisoners could eat at the governor's table. We actually have an authorization for one prisoner to eat whatever the governor wanted at his table. This must have been a strange sensation because you probably were fed very well, but you knew you were going to be taken back to this grim cell once you'd eaten. Then we have another account from uh, after the Bastille fell. It's not clear who left this account, but supposedly on Sunday people got a bodyguard's bullion, a slice of boiled cow, and small pies not cooked enough to be good in the evening, a slice of roast veal or mutton, a little haricot. Now haricot could mean beans, but it also meant a sort of stew with veal and turnips, and apparently this was mainly turnips. Uh, a salad, and usually with the worst quality of oil, barely good enough for street lamps. And all the meat dishes, the meat meals were apparently the same. On Tuesday, uh, okay, so on Mondays you can get two small pies or two cutlets and a haricot. On Tuesday, a sausage or a pig's foot or a lightly grilled piece of pork, supposedly fresh. Wednesday, a little tilt. Uh, filled with kitchen leftovers, the man said, and the base almost always burned or half-baked. Thursday, tripe with sauce or some old scraps of fowl that wouldn't last until the following Sunday. Friday for dinner, a little fried carp or raised stinking of cod or some dried out fried food with a dish of eggs. For supper, spinach or other vegetables. Again, this is a fast day and two soft boiled eggs. Saturday, same as the day before, and so we began again for 52 weeks in a year. Again, each prisoner got a pound of bread a day, but this person says the bottle of wine was always bad and sour as vinegar. Dessert was an apple, certainly not the best. A few almonds and raisins lightly strewn on a plate. Rarely cherries in season or gooseberries. That would really be too fine, says this writer. And then the finer tables, for whom there was a higher rate, would get soup on a meat day and boiled beef in an entree. In the evening, a slice of roast, a sauce, a salad. On fast days, a soup, a dish of fish, two entrees. Uh, the evening, a dish of eggs and a vegetable. Then, uh, in the morning and for supper, a dessert of a biscuit or an apple. And finally, a bottle of wine a day. The difference between the standard and the high fare was very small, a chicken or more, or a pigeon, or a bad quarter of rabbit 
or some birds. And all this on tin, unless you were somebody of rank, in which case you could pay to have faience and a silver spoon and fork. Now, we've already seen that Marmontel got a silver spoon and fork without asking for it. As to the tin normally used, it is impossible to imagine how dirty the dishes and the plates are. And this person goes on to say, there is no dive at 12 sous a meal where one is not better fed than at the Bastille. Now you'll note that a number of the things listed here are the same as other prisoners listed, but presented under a darker light, like the biscuit with apples. So it's hard to tell if this person was exaggerating or if conversely, maybe the early memoirists kind of overstated how good things were for them. But I think in general, if you uh, consider all the accounts taken together, it certainly won't leave you wanting to have been in the Bastille, where you would have likely ended up at best in a tower that was cold in the winter and hot in the summer and with very little light, especially after they began to close off the windows so prisoners couldn't yell out them like the Marquis de Sade did at one point. But if it was still around and did takeout, you might be tempted to order takeout from the Bastille.